uh, I guess I'll uh, do a little introduction. Um, maybe tell the story how we, you know, how Travis, you and I met. Uh, Duncan found Russell Gold, who wrote Superpower. That you know, it's a great book out there today. But he's like a Wall Street Journal reporter. He had posted this uh, story on LinkedIn about the first distributed energy resource project. I think if we can officially call it that, right? Uh, first, uh, behind the meter, you know, you, you probably don't even know the terms. You're like, I don't know. I just, the meter, the meter, so. uh, yeah. 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 First, the PR project in New York in, in the uh, and there was a photo in a, uh, you know, then we started researching, uh, some other articles written about it, and it said photo credit Travis Rice, and we're like, who's this guy who took this picture? We wanted the photo, it's actually, it's, it's hanging, if you guys noticed when you walked in, of them hoisting the first wind turbine up in, uh, um, it was on the, a building in the Lower East Side. And um, so we reached out to you, Travis, and you were nice enough to send us the, the photo uh, so we could print it. Oh, you got some of your own there too, nice. Uh, <laughs> And we got to chatting, and Travis was nice enough to agree to, to kind of tell the next generation <laughs> of DDR developers uh, how, how it's really done. So I'm going to shut up and, and let Travis talk. But uh, try and, um, you know, normally in these presentations, we, like, everyone jumps in. But we actually have one of those, like, conference room microphones. So if you do want to ask a question, we're going to, we're actually going to maybe try and mute this while he's talking. Uh, uh, so you don't get too much background noise. Just, but just flag one of us down if you it, want to ask a question. Yeah, and if you or, or just come up here and you know jump in as push as, the is, as yeah. is uh, our style, I guess. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks, Travis, for yeah. for joining us. This is well, hey, y'all, it's it's good to um, thanks for having me on. It's uh, this is my office. Um, we're down in Georgetown uh, on the CNO Canal in Washington D.C. D.C. stands for the District of Crime, and. Um, you're welcome to laugh. I'm not going to say anything very serious. So, but my, um, how do I tell the story? Um, I started off as uh, born in a, the Okefenokee swamps of Georgia and kind of migrated through uh, my father's career into Panama and Heidelberg and other parts of the world. But uh, fundamentally, I always knew I was going to be an architect and live in a tree house since I was about 12. And actually I do live in a tree house right now in the middle of DC. But um, I, um, I sort of migrated into architecture and even more so dropped out for a while to study the great 100 classics, uh, the great classical books, the 100 greatest books. And um, so it put my mind into like change assumptions, right? So it's like 19, 70s and I'm finishing a master's degree in architecture. I'm giving you a little background so you know how I got to New York City. Um, I was living up in north of Santa Fe working on a thesis called uh, um, A Solar Village and I got all my inspiration by camping out in a very ancient 12th century place called Pueblo Bonito. It's in uh, northern New Mexico and it is extraordinary. It's this gigantic curved buildings, the ruins, three, four, five stories tall. And the snow kept melting, camping there in the dead of winter. And I realized that all this sun was coming in and focusing on um, the center courtyard, the plaza, and melting all the snow. And this is where everybody did all their work. So I said, God, you know, that's like, uh, that's really cool. I should design a house for my thesis, a bunch of houses facing south with curves. And, you know, I'll just sort of heat the house passively with solar energy. So I coined this term for my thesis called passive solar villages. And I coined the word passive solar. That was way back in the day before I dyed my hair gray recently. And um, anyway, so the bottom line is I got this whole like, wild idea out west. That's why I have cowboy hats. Uh, and um, we built my thesis while I was in school, a passive solar village. And that wasn't enough for me to live out in those canyons and get this really cool housing going. Um, I decided to take the Jeep and got a consulting job in New York City. If you can believe this, I moved to New York City in 1974, three or four, I think it was, 
I came in in a Jeep from one canyon to another, like New York was just a big canyon to me. Luckily, I had a place to crash. I had no money, per se. I was consulting the federal government to write national energy standards for America, the first ever by, guess who? President Richard Nixon. <laughs> Nixon and a lot of the Republicans then were very much the leaders in not energy conservation, mind you, um, energy self-reliance. As Senator Percy once said, who I wrote papers for, um, and I wrote papers for Jimmy Carter as well, Republicans and Democrats, um, and a barrel saved is a barrel made. It's like a business deal. And at that time, everything was about literally people shooting each other at gas stations because of the Aramco deal. So here I am walking in the middle of New York City, and I thought, well, I did this passive solar thing. I've got to do two things. My social justice headset and my solar headset said, look, um, you got to do this. So I'm camping out at um, a very rich person's house, sleeping on a cot in the basement. And um, I'd walk up and down in the snow of New York City, going back to before to work on this project. And I kept looking for housing, right? And people that were doing some kind of housing. I went all the way to Harlem every night in the snow. I went out to East, the South Bronx. I went to Bed-Stuy. And luckily, one day I stumbled into these crazy characters down on 519 East 11th Street. And they had just taken over a building, Michael Friedberg and most of the people were Puerto Ricanos, which is why it's called New Eureka, right? And the New Rican Poets Cafe was there. Um, and uh, Miguel Pinero was still around. He'd written this amazing uh, play. But this building, 519 East 11th Street, was completely wrecked. There were, in that 1973-4, there probably every other building in the street had been sort of beaten up and mutilated. There was nobody living there. And you saw this all over the South Bronx. You saw it all over you know, Harlem, everywhere that was poor. And what was really cool was a group of people had gotten together to do a sweat equity co-op conversion. In other words, they had organized enough that, and, and remember JB, this guy from Jamaica, actually his former house was a Goodwill box. He would sneak into the Goodwill boxes at night and get warm and sleep there. So we're all sitting there talking and I'm going like, okay, you guys, let's go protest the city. We did, we all got arrested, no big deal. It's comf more comfortable than a uh, Goodwill box, right? So we, um, the fun part was we got the city, rather than spending $10,000 to tear down the five-story building, um, to give it to us, give us the 10 grand. And then we got a loan for three or 400,000, I forget what it was, to actually hire ourselves to rebuild the building. Now that year in New York alone, Bill Moyers on the Bill Moyers Journal did a whole story called The Fire Next Door. There was a building an hour being broken down by the mafia, take out the plugs, the copper and all this stuff, right? And burnt internally. So 519 had had a couple of fires. And by the time we cleaned her out, we had taken out two cars, three cars. East 11th Street was kind of like the carjacking center. They would just openly on the street start dismantling stolen cars. So this, this is the uh, background. And so here I am coming in with this uh, wild cowboy, hippie, crazy solar idea. Nobody in their mind even knew what the word insulation meant. There was no insulation in the mortgage uh, construction financing. So uh, we got going. I said, look, if you insulate, that's like going to be 70% of your problem solved. Nobody really got it. They just kept thinking, no, I don't get this. Now I'm dealing with a lot of folks who are off the street, mostly Puerto Ricans from, they call the Salvas, from the jungle, not from San Juan, two different, completely different cultures. And um, so we get going, I join the co-op, I'm starting to get going, we're doing construction, and there's some great photos of this. And um, so I'm going, guys, we have to get, we have to get this place insulated, and there's this new thing called solar energy. <laughs> I mean, as far as they thought, I was talking about getting a suntan on the roof. And um, so luckily, um, I made these contacts, um, through some of my early solar work 
with um, Congressman, um, what was his name? I can't remember his name, but he was uh, from uh, up, like uh, one of the boroughs of New York City. And he was all hot to trot on trying to get energy savings for poor people through what was called the Office of Economic Opportunity, the Community Services Administration. So I didn't know diddly squat about how do you get, how do you write a grant? A good friend of mine gave me a book called The Bread Game, how to get, how to basically write a grant. And so while we were working uh, on the building before we boxed it in, or in, you know, put in the sheetrock, um, I got a hold of these guys at, um, at Dick Ottinger, that was the guy, and, and, he, and, and one of his top eight said, look, we have a huge um, issue here with uh, energy and the Arabs, um, and we would like to, you know, get, promote energy. So they, they hooked me up with the CSA, the Community Service Administration. They were a group of people, the CSA, who went to all the poor communities in America for the federal government and kind of gave them subsidies for, you know, taping up your windows, ceiling buildings. And um, I got to talking with a guy named Dick Saul and I started talking to him about like, hey, you know, we really could use insulation here. And he goes, yeah, this is a political game for us down in Washington. Now remember, I'm on East 11th Street. This is pre, um, hey, iPhone 11 Pro, get it. Um, so th this was before all that, right? So what happened was we, um, we started mousing around with making this congressman feel more popular. I knew a friend named Ed Barber up at Princeton. He was a professor, but he, he had also started the first, one of the first solar hot water collector companies in America, Sunworks it was called. Very first, like only one or two people actually doing production work. I mean, you can build a solar collector with copper pipes and some solder. So I'd done a lot of that in New Mexico myself. And we even built photovoltaic cell things. We stole a lot of leftover photovoltaics from NASA out at um, uh, Los Alamos, the, the science center where they invented the nuclear bomb uh, near Santa Fe many years ago. And um, so we would make all these things. But I said, look, we can get, let's do this. We can get a grant and the, and the service administration I'm telling you guys all these stories. Are you guys okay with this? Are you? You're gone. Yeah, we're yeah. great. So, um, so, so this is, this is kind of why my friend, I'm half Greek and half Irish, so he calls me the Socratic leprechaun. But I, I kind of figured out that um, how are we going to get this insulation? So I, I got a hold of um, this guy, Dick Stahl, in the... Nixon administration, the guy in charge, he got me in charge in, in, in the guy, the head of the community service, poor people's administration, which was Dick Cheney. Can you believe it? <laughs> so Dick Cheney, you know, all these guys got on board and they said, yeah, okay, let's do, we need a hit. We need a hit. We need a home run. So I put together my first five page proposal. We would like to insulate this building, uh, 519 11th street and did a quickie little sketch. And we'd like to put solar hot water heaters on it. Okay, sounds cool, sounds cool. And typical as government grants go, I mean, a month went by, two months, three, six. We're starving. Luckily, I had a girlfriend who could feed me. I was living on, you know, dollar bills. And, um, and I figured, well, what the heck? Um, here's what we're going to do. So we got a hold of this Dick Ottinger. I got one of the solar collectors from up at... Uh, Princeton brought it down, put it on the roof one day, got up on the roof, we got the congressman there, we got the, um, the local news, ABC, NBC, I can't remember these days, uh, I think it was pre-Fox, so it wasn't them. But um, the, um, the thing was so cool because I got the collector on the roof and everybody thought I was like some voodoo magician, right? Because I'm pouring hot water in this collector and as it rolls down, of course it's turned to steam, blowing out. And Dick Ottinger, the congressman's doing this. So I ran downstairs, there were no cell phones. I ran down to the corner where there was a one bodega where you got the two choices of sandwiches, eat it or don't. And um, you know, basically I called up, I called you know, with nickels and quarters, the guys at the grand office down in DC. And I said, look, I'm on the roof with a US congressman. 
I'm telling him that we're going to do this. He is congratulating us. It's going to be on NBC National. Um, <laughs> do we have the grant or don't we? <laughs> so, uh, 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 you have the grant. Okay. Okay. So I run back and not, not trusting, you know, once again, the government's word, I got on the, the TV and said, we're glad to say that Dick Saul and Dick Cheney have awarded us the grant today. <laughs> so I had them on the hooker. And, um, you know, within about, uh, within about, you know, six weeks, we had the money, about 50 grand to insulate the building and put up the solar collectors. Um, and that was in the, the picture I just showed. And there's pictures about all this. Um, so I'm giving you the slow story, but that built such a vibration that, that once that got out in the news, um, it did two things, really important things locally and think local, you know, act, glo act global, think local and all this stuff was going on. Um, that the local community, this became like their church. 519 was to be protected at all costs because there were so many break-ins. I lost my Jeep twice, got the tires back and all this stuff. I finally dealt with the local mafia and nobody ever touched my car again, which was good. But um, um, back we became very good friends. So um, some days I'd like to use them in some of the problems I have here. But, but the thing is, um, we, we, we got the money and we, we, and about that time, these two cool guys, uh, David Norris was a architecture student up at uh, Yale and Chip Tabor, I was an architect student at MIT. They had heard about this through the solar collector owner. Um, um, Brett Bart, I'll think of his name in a minute. Um, so they came down and they wanted to kind of mix their master's thesis with working with me and Michael Friedberg in 519. And, and so we formed a really terrific team and we, we called ourselves the Energy Task Force, El Movimiento de 519. Um, and, um, and so this whole other genre kind of grew of energy self-reliance. Well, the community just loved it. We blended, sort of. And, um, and then um, that year, the federal government gave, because of the power of this article, this uh, thing happening, I think they got almost three times, I forget how many millions of dollars of extra federal money to help other poor people. Because, so the flagship kind of worked for a bigger picture helping more people, but it also worked locally. And, um, and then it was a different world. It was like, like all federal government projects come about October, November, they haven't spent their 35 or 40 million yet. They have about 2 million left. And if they don't spend it, their budget goes down the next year, right? So uh, no good deed goes uh, unpunished. Um, but they always start calling all their grantees and saying, what do you got? What, what, just tell us what you want. You know? So I said, ah, oh, this other guy just showed up, Ted Finch. And I'd worked on some Jacobs wind machines out in New Mexico with Bob Rinus. But, but uh, uh, he really, um, um, really understood um, wind machine tech, you know, the technology of building it. So Ted, we put a grant in. We put another, I don't know, 25 or 30 grand in. Um, by the way, in each of these grants, for some reason, they, 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 they said you have to spend $5,000 uh, on accounting and you have to take it up to Miguel Pinheiro up at uh, somewhere in the Bronx and pay them. <laughs> I went, well, like, we're only going to write four checks. Why do we need accountants? You know? <laughs> and um, so I would go up there to take the five grand, I'm giving you fun sides of the tale. Um, I mean, meanwhile, we're freezing, snow, ice up on the roof. I mean, you have no idea how hard it was and um, burning fires of cars in the streets. Um, but um, it, um, it kept you warm some nights. But the, but the thing is, um, I go up there and there's nobody in this room except this one guy in a really slick suit sitting at a desk with no papers, nothing. And I write him the check for the accounting. Well, three years later up in the South Bronx, when I got into another project, one day I was telling these guys the story, these Latino guys, Puerto-Ricanos, and um, they said, oh my, you said, who you see? I said, Miguel, I said, Travis, do you know who you were with? I said, no, I have no idea. 
He's the head of the entire Puerto Rican mafia. This is the guy that nobody ever sees. <laughs> and an accountant. Yes, and yeah. Well, I mean, all in the end, I mean, Godfather is all about accounting in the end. So uh, the, 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 the cool thing was, though, that you really began to understand the Italian Sicilian life, the mafia life. When the police are corrupt and when the government's corrupt, there's only one person that can protect you, and that's your family. And your family just happens to be the bad good guy, which is a really popular theme in the you know Godfather and all the current movies. Uh, Ray Donovan, all this stuff is about the bad guy that's a little better than the worst guy. So uh, dystopia in, in, in a way. But um, there it was, it was very funny to experience all that. But we got this wind machine and that's really was amazing because we, we had to figure out stuff. We got Charlie Copeland to help us with some engineering. A lot of people volunteered. Um, can, can you tell us what a Jacobs wind turbine was? Oh uh, yeah, across America there, there were essentially wind machines, not, um, you know, a, a slow prop is a pump. I mean, high speed is a generator. It's just like your car turning and making electricity on the fan belt. This is just a wind machine. It's, it's, it was one of the most famous products in the 30, 40, 50s because all the farmers had no electricity. There were thousands and thousands of Jacobs and they could take two to three lightning hits and still keep churning. They were kind of the best of the best at the time. Of uh, we, you know, we've refined a lot of wind machines today, rotaries and egg beaters, and and the, the, the you know the acrylic fins and all this stuff has gone way beyond that. But that's all there was. And I think we bought the thing for three or four k, and about four or five thousand. We somewhere in there we fixed it up. So, so you then, were using uh, like nineteen forties tech. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I mean, the solar collectors were new, but it, it, there's, there's really no magic to energy, right? I mean, 90% um, 90, 90 of the problem is insulation. I tell people 90% of the problem is how many BTUs on the head of a pin. It's medieval. It's just dumb. It's simple. Stop consuming. <laughs> That's all you got to do. <laughs> there, there is no solar pill. There's no wind pill. There's no hydroelectric pill. I mean, that stuff is only good if you cut consumption and they, then my clients say, but we have LED lights. We can have 10 times the lights. I went, no, no, Dodo, that's not the problem. That's not the solution, you know? Um, but there's still a mindset of consumption that really overwhelms us. I mean, to, to keep these babies running, I mean, to go get the stuff in that the Chinese take out of South America to make the batteries. I mean, the, the carbon footprint of these little babies is humongous, right? Not to mention operating energy costs. So I, I could go off into where I am today about all these things, but which is just a lot more practice and knowledge. But to end the, the story, we, um, we had to get the wind machine up. How on that roof do you put another tower 40 feet up? You're already like seven, 65, 70 feet up. And I'm acrophobic as hell. I don't like it. But the, 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 um, the fun part was we, we, we came up with the design of a triangulated little tower and we had to tie cables at four places. So we were able to put enough concrete on the roof to kind of tie this thing down because it will hum and move like nothing, right? So then um, we had the, the three feet that had to go on top of three little slide-ons and then tied in. We had no idea. We had no money for cranes, anything. So we just got everybody, we made a big fiesta party for the block. We got about 10 cases of beer. We got everybody up on the roof, a little drunk, which helped a lot. And I get courage up, yeah. I'll never forget, like, pulling that thing up in the air. The wind's blowing. The machine's not on it yet. This is just the tower. Getting in there and then getting it straight and then lifting up and moving two inches and sliding down. Holy shit. That was so scary because everybody was drunk, but it was everybody on all the different roofs around the area pulling and tugging. And about an hour and a half, we had it up and locked in and bolted. And then after that, um, then it was steel and just climb up and get, you know, use winches and get the machine up. And we put a big 11th Street logo on the tail of it. And 
that was we thought was so cool. We went to Umberto's Clam Bar over in the village, the Italian area. It's a great little clam bar at the time. A lot of shootouts that happened there. We had a little TV, <laughs> and we were watching all of ourselves on TV that night because it was all over the news, right? Big deal, you know. New Yorkers hustle the wind. We, we had done this thing, and we're thinking, yeah, so cool. We weren't even thinking. We knew Con Ed was not going to be happy. <laughs> we first meet her because we had called him up about it, but we didn't think it was a big deal. We'll work it out. It's better to apologize, uh, right, than get stuck behind government uh, regulations and do nothing. Uh, that was the viewpoint. Uh, that's what I think of sometimes. So, so anyway, um, in New Mexico, you do this stuff and people think you're normal. So it, it, anyway, the, the, um, then of course, within hours, the lawsuit hits big time. <laughs> uh, you know, you guys are reversing. And then we said, no, we have a synchronous converter. We're reversing the meter, but we are, our juice is synchronized with your juice. There won't be any blips in, in frequency. Blah, blah, blah. No, 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 you can't. We have to research this. Blah, blah. I said, no, we, it's already been researched by Jan, blah, 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 in Germany. You know, we know all this stuff. Of course, you can't talk to them because the regs are the regs. I get it. That's their job. But this went on and on and on. And um, I was burning out about then. I, and I had a great group of folks and we'd gotten some more grants and trained a lot of Latino local guys to do our job. Our job was to disappear. We had hoped to land, paratroop in, get all of our stuff done, train other people, and go migrate somewhere else and spread the word, right? Uh, Johnny Appleseed attitude. So, um, so, so anyway, we don't know what we're doing. We have not a nickel to our names. And one day the door knocks on my apartment, which was our office in 519 East 11th Street. And this drawling Southerner comes in and I, I recognized his voice and he said, I said, is Travis Price here? What are you doing? I said, yeah. I said, well, I've heard about this, uh, this fight with Con Ed. I mean, this is the best thing since civil rights. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm the United States Attorney General, and I'm going to defend you. <laughs> so it was so cool. And at that point, I began to migrate out of town. I was um, getting on everybody's nerves and my own. Um, but eventually it worked its way up to the courts and the state Supreme Court of New York uh, ruled in our favor that we could co-generate. Wow. That was a huge, huge, huge deal breaker. We had no idea even how big a deal it was. But all of a sudden at 25 or so, I was, you know, I had to shave and put on a suit and go down to Congress and testify in Washington at Dick Ottinger's hearings on, um, you know, the the... Public Utilities Regulation Policy Act, PERPA, and that got passed. And the wind machine was kind of the, the, the stir, if you were, for um, allowing utilities to co-generate uh, with, uh, in, and allow people to co-generate with utility. It had been banned, um, and, and for good reason. I mean, you have to understand utilities are like hospitals. They get a two to 3% profit margin by law they are you. They are us. We switch on the lights, and if it, and, and they're a monopoly because you can't you can't go out and build five of these things. You got to build one because it's billions of dollars of to, to put together, and we are on one grid, right? So there, there's a deeper history I learned later about why it was there, but it did take something like this putting I call it putting the spear in the cyclops's eye, like Odysseus did to get his men out of the cave. <laughs> we this is what we had to do to turn that meter back that time back um and so that was it I'll, I'll never forget like a few years later ted kennedy was flying into new york and, and there were loads of blackouts i love the blackouts in new york they were always so much fun because within seven minutes people were yelling in the dark t-shirts three dollars batteries twenty dollars you know? <laughs> <laughs> perfectly new york but um <laughs> Um, the, um, and he looked down and he said, wow, that's, there was only one little light on, that was 519, he said, that's, that's the little wind machine that could, you know, that's 519. Um, so Sorry, Dave said that? Is that what you said? Ted Kennedy did, yeah. Hey, oh, Kennedy. okay. Is that, wow. Yeah. And, um, and then subsequently, um, 
more and more of these projects like the South Bronx, we had a much bigger project. It did not have a wind machine, but it had solar collectors. And we even did a biological basement factory where you put from, you know, uh, human poop and all kinds of ingredients. And you went through these different tanks, growing different mollusks and so on. And at the end, you ended up with tilapia fish, the new alchemist. If you ever want to look up something, look up the new alchemist uh, guys from uh, Prince Edward Island up in Canada. So we did one of these as an urban project. And then um, I decided I had enough. I came down to Washington. All my team was funded. I raised about a million bucks for everybody. And I just had to get out of New York City. It was pounding me too much. And uh, especially that bad girlfriend. And uh, <laughs> so um, um, that was another story. Um, <laughs> not just about women, but uh, but about the people I've met. I got to really, really good friends with Robert Redford and uh, Paul Simon, all these characters, because she was their agent. <laughs> and we put some wind machines. And, and Lola Redford, Bob's wife, and I founded, uh, with a group of people, the National Center for Appropriate Technology out in Butte, Montana, which was training people. That was my big issue, was how to train people to build um, local, you know, self-reliant technologies. Um, I think I called it energy, economic development and employment. This is a paper I wrote for Jimmy Carter's campaign on how to make jobs happen locally using alternative energy and to, to grow, to grow jobs. I mean, people as I often tell people, nobody cares about saving $3 a month on their fuel bill in, in low income areas. What they care about is making a thousand or $2,000 a month. So until you do a large number of things, it's meaningless because that's saving the planet is not the issue. It's saving the people. And I guess most of us understand that is the planet, but a lot of people think the plants are more intelligent than the people that, but that's another hippie story. Um, I, I think, I, I, I think that, um, the only last thing I have to say, and I'd, I'd love to hear you guys ask questions is, I don't know what time it is, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine for time, but I think the um, the irony was I ended up back in Washington for six months consulting the National American Institute of Architects on their energy research and putting together a big program conferences. I just needed some money and time out to think about the next path. I, I'd done my work in New Mexico uh, being the godfather of passive solar, and we'd done the urban version for the poor, which I thought was, a, for me, it was a personally a great time great accomplishment because uh, everybody talks, but very few people walk, you know, in this business. <laughs> and and um, I like that. And I like the fact that policy changed and suddenly I'm working in this place and this little Jewish guy I'd met with Lola and Bob at some conference and with other people and they were booing me. That was, it was like, um, a lot of corporations wanted to get grants for solar collectors and space technology and all this stuff. And I stood up and started talking about poor people and how we could help them and, and 519 11th Street. And all these uh, tech heads started booing me down saying, okay, that's later, 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 Trav. I went, well, let's start from the ground up, you know? And um, this little voice came out, well, I'm a real so super Southern draw. I knew he must have been from some horrible place like, uh, you know, Louisiana. And, uh, Next and uh, he um, said, well, I think Travis has a point here, you know, and we, we could really do this. No, no, no. So I never heard this guy get, I talked to him briefly, Dave Freeman. And I swear to God, I, I, it's like years later and I'm in this office in New York, in uh, New York Avenue, right next to the White House where the AIA is. And this voice comes on the phone and says, hello. And I said, yeah, this, this is Travis Price. I said, yeah, yeah, uh, this is Dave Freeman. I said, yeah, I remember your voice. What, what are you doing? He says, look, I don't have a lot of time. I have an assistant here. I'm sitting here with Jimmy Carter, and um, he's just made me the chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the biggest uh, utility in America on seven states. And I want you to quit your job right now. I want you down in Knoxville tomorrow with me, and we're going to fucking solarize the whole goddamn valley. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Two nights later, I was drunk as a skunk with Dave in his apartment, and uh, he was the chairman of TVA. And in the course of the next, well, we, we wrote a script that night for a movie about what we were going to do from hydro to coal to nuke to solar. 
I zipped up to New York the next day and got Bob Redford to do a um, voiceover for us. And three days later, the, the TVA's policy changed. This whole video came out on every TV station. And in the course of the next year and a half, I not only find I was on the TVA board meetings as the solar guy. Imagine this, the utility jump, right? Understanding and meeting everybody who had created nuclear, coal, and hydro. And I got to tell you, every one of them was a hero. They had all tried to do something in the good days of whatever they were doing, jobs or nuclear. Remember, nuclear is the biggest solar energy package out there. And um, they really were trying to help the world. So it was kind of fun. They were like, oh, solar, that's so great. Welcome aboard. And by the time the nine months were up, not only had we financed 100,000 solar hot water heaters, we had built two solar factories. <laughs> And I had trained unemployed black youth in, in Knox, in Memphis, to uh, install. And we had our first thousand systems underway and they were done in three months. And every house got a $3 deduction from their fuel bill. Um, no, uh, sorry, $15 <laughs> deduction from their fuel bill. And it cost them $12 a month for their solar collector system. So it was seamless. Jobs were everything. And this grew and grew. I think the last I heard years ago was up to 40, 50,000 were done. And I also, Dave, when I said, I need a new building for the, the, the nuclear division in Chattanooga, I did a model overnight of this wild thing I'd done in school, like a gigantic Pueblo. And uh, today it's there. We built in the next four years, the world's largest, still largest solar building. It's a million square feet in downtown Chattanooga, you can go down to the TVA building and see it, and it beams light all through it to, to, to eliminate the lighting loads. So and we cut lighting, heating, cooling by 78% compared to a high rise that went up next door that year. And we came in $2 a square foot less to build the building. And it's just, it's phenomenally there. And it, the last thing I'll say is I even had a plan to use waste wood chips from the the, the foresting for you know that we're going around for furniture and all this stuff and we were going to put a power machine inside the building and it emitted almost zero emissions compared to the coal plants 30 miles away um, and we're going to take the entire building off grid so can you imagine that the nuclear tech uh, division is not even using their own utility power grid <laughs> <laughs> They thought that was a little too far for the moment. <laughs> so we took that 10 million out of the deal. But um, that is a really interesting wrap up to the voyage, you know, from uh, watching Pueblo Indians, actually um, from way back from 1100, knowing how to make a building use sunlight, wrestling through the canyons of New York City, putting up a wind machine, turning the meter backwards, and then uh, landing, uh, you know, going into a huge promulgation of the whole idea. Um, history after that's changed a bit, but uh, Dave used to say things. Dave used to make a lot of compromises. He was a great mentor. He's 97. He's here in D.C. I've seen him recently. He was a big mentor to me. He's writing his third book right now on all electric, and um, he keeps asking me to find him a girlfriend. I'm not sure about that. But, and, <laughs> It, it, it's um, it, it's quite interesting to see that um, you know where where are we gonna go um, and who's gonna do it and while it, it, it seems political at times um, somebody asked me about this wind machine oh you were fighting the utility company I said no I wasn't I they're just another company like a hospital I just wanted to teach people how to be self-reliant <laughs> it's really simple Barrel saves, a barrel made. And um, how do you do that over a long term? Well, you know, I gave a lecture in Canada about six years ago. They did a tracing of all of us uh, solar pioneers. They, they nailed five of us as being, they took every energy thing that's out there and they worked it backwards to where did it start? And I was one of the five because we were starting to create all these things out in New Mexico. And so you, wow, you have no idea. I haven't even told you what we used to build out there. Car. Cars, the Mercedes that ran on carrots. We had one of those. Um, really great scientists' minds out there in the desert. Um, 
But um, what, what I said to people is they said, well, what's changed? What's changed? Said, well, I'll tell you what's changed, and it's not good. Contrary to the Club of Rome and a lot of predictions, uh, there's more oil now than there's ever been. We, we were supposed to be out of oil by 2010, right? In 1980. That was like doomsday stuff, right? Chicken little stuff. And the other bad news is that um, oil, gasoline and is per gallon is cheaper per, I mean, fuel is cheaper per BTU per dollar than it's ever been in history. I mean, you can fill up, you can put a gallon of gas in for one Starbucks. So, you know, it's, it's so small compared to what we are. I mean, this is, there's a lot of political reasons behind this. So I said, that's bad news. And what's really bad news is car culture globally, especially, I don't know if you guys have been to India. I, 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 go, I travel a lot around the world for Nat Geographic and lecture. I go to a lot of places, of remote jungles. But every place in the world, especially Asia, is a nightmare of um, car consumption. A true nightmare because there are no pollution controls whatsoever. Uh, you, you vomit when you get to Chengdu in China. You can't take it. So, um, it, but... But so that's big. The only thing that's good is what you guys are doing. It's, it's that the culture is there now to cultivate um, a not just cleaner, but a really self-reliant society. And that's probably the biggest advance. There's a lot to be done, but it's really, I think that's the big advance. It is now, uh, even though sometimes I call this the age of, uh, we've gone from green radical to green uh, uh, um, greenwash in the 90s and now we might be in the green bling era where you know everybody's got to have a lead button on their forehead or something <laughs> but getting the nitty-gritty done that's the game you know and 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 i think um <clears throat> i mean the evolution is happening and i think that that's that's because of the culture and you're the culture so. thank you Travis. I'll be running for president and no, okay. <laughs> I, I gotta say, I think that's the best uh, DER story I've ever heard. I haven't heard one that top that. Uh, so thank you for sharing and thank you for, you know, your service, I guess. You're the, the godfather of the movement and we're uh, humbly trying to, no, trying to no, continue I'm the work. So uh, I don't, I, I, I'd love to, I don't know if anyone wants to ask questions. I know I have like 50, but uh, um, I don't know. Does anyone start it off? Start it off? I'm yeah, curious, what, what, uh, what was the Energy Task Force, an, Task Force Anthem? What, what music were you guys listening to when you were throwing, <laughs> throwing wind turbines up? Maybe on a bad day, Jimi Hendrix, and on a good day, you know, Van Morrison. I don't know. <laughs> Van the man. Um, I don't know that um, we were just intense, you know. Um, but, but, you're, you're talking to a guy who likes to go dancing. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, but our, mo our, mo our motto was really, um, you know, doing the right thing. Yeah, bottom up you know help help the the low first and go higher and and uh be self-reliant with uh, simple energy uh tools really um, sounds very nerdy but we're all we're, we're all architects so we're very flamboyant about our poetics too but, uh, <laughs> yeah we gotta we gotta learn from that um no but I, but I, or do you want to go i was i was gonna ask now the I'll, I'll go. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested in this. Yeah, you, you have this sort of like community ethos. You were you were sort of building this all upon, um, and you're talking about jobs and sort of no one cares about three dollars on their fuel bill. They care about you know work. Um, it sounds like what you're describing, like the the 2018 version of this, is the Green New Deal, right? And I'm I wonder, do you see something like is that a fair comparison? Or you know, I the do vision. You I think the vision is fair, um, but I think uh, uh, the Cortez chick. I think her. The only issue I have with her is you know that where do you get the money? One, one thing I've learned in life is yeah, the grants help, but you um, you really do. I mean, I, I don't. I think how do I say this? Um, 
I know a lot of conservatives, I know a lot of liberals, and I think that the issue is not political really at this point. It's really about what Chuck Percy used to say. I mean, it was the same phrase about a barrel saved, barrel made. You've got to think about it. Um, how do you economically pull this off in a capitalist democracy, right? Without sinking the ship with overtaxation. That's going to be the biggest problem that, that the, the foursome or, or certainly her group faces is what I face is I can't, we, you know, once, yeah, grant here and there works, but if you try and multiply that out towards the whole picture, I don't know, it's never going to work socialistically. So we got to come up with a way. And I thought Obama started this with a guy who left it early in his um, regime, which was to, you, you've got to come up with banks and financing that really is just normal capitalism. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was very disappointed in the Obama years because right outside of DC, about 30 miles um, is a town. And I went to an opening there when I moved here in like, I think it was like 1995 or six, of SolarX, this big solar company that made photovoltaic cells. It was so cool. I used to drive by there going out to West Virginia uh, to pick up a new Confederate flag. I'm just joking. But it, 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 the factory, the, the ribbon cutting was cutting the cable from the power company to the factory. That was great. Two years later, the factory doubled. Two years after um, Barack came in, it was gone. It was, I, sh I was shocked. The entire place was demolished. It was gone. And I went, where is this? Well, the Chinese bought it. It's all in China now. And so anybody that's bought a PV upper, you know, piece from uh, Amazon that's made in China knows how long it lasts, which is about a day or two. Um, so it, it, I think you're going to have to pull back and, and make a kind of economic development package out of it that works in America, where you produce things here. And you, I, this sounds very Trumpian, but in, in, in this case, it's true. Um, you've got to have some kind of mm, business, not government, do the job. And, and I think that that's kind of my idea of what it's like. I mean, I'm just giving you my opinion. It's the only thing I can think that will really last. Um, yeah. So uh, to that point, you know, I was actually thinking while you were talking, um, you know, the fact that you had uh, Dick Cheney and Ted Kennedy behind <laughs> what you were doing uh, maybe is something that sounds very foreign to, to everyone in the room today. So like, I, you know, I, I've always thought we need to um, not, not make this a divisive issue and, and uh, you know, apolitical in a sense, as, as, as uh, you know, you've pointed out. Um, you know, do you think that's primarily like a, a cultural thing or is it a messaging thing or, uh, you know, what were sort of like the effective, how was it that you guys managed to get, you know, who is now seen as like, you know, maybe to Republicans, the, the villain of the Democrats and to the Democrats, the villain of the Republicans uh, on the same page as far as uh, pushing these, these solutions forward. Well, Tesla, was there any Tesla, trick that or was it just... I don't know uh, anybody on the right or left that doesn't like Tesla, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean you, you got to get, I think, some really sharp entrepreneurs. And, and, and yeah, we do have to level it out like oil tax and, you know, subsidies for, I mean, two... 62% of a gallon of gasoline, it goes to state taxes to make the roads work, right? So everybody, now they're gonna start taxing electric cars because you're not taking, you're not paying gasoline, but you gotta pay for your highway. So, um, and, and that'll be a fair, fair offer because they're still using the highways. But the point is, I think you can find entrepreneurs out there who can blur these two lines together um, because I don't think Congress, well, certainly in the state we're all in right now, not, not much uh, bipartisan work is going to get done, except when economic powers out there, um, what's the guy's name? I forget all of a sudden, Tesla man. Elon Musk. Elon yeah, yeah, Musk, yeah. I mean, you, gotta, you have to have characters like that, I think, kind of take, take big gulps and then muscle, a lot of muscle on the street with politics to keep to make sure that the taxes and the cash flow and the subsidies and the public interest stuff doesn't collapse the economy uh, too quickly. And, and 
I think that that's I don't I don't really I've never seen I've worked a lot in government projects and the budgets are usually triple and the and the time slag is usually five times longer. So I don't think they should be doing this stuff. They're much better at managing other things, regulations and stuff. But you really do need to sort of get the private sector to go really big with it. I mean, TVA could do it because TVA was a private utility which had no profit, but they were able to operate within their larger margins to create all these projects. And in the year we financed the collectors, we also financed shade trees. <laughs> We financed all kinds of stuff that I wrote up in my report. And the money we used was borrowed money from Wall Street, but it offset two nuclear reactors, which was several billion dollars. So that was a very interesting sort of public utility, but Dave's mindset was very much a kind of nice capitalism because he could take from one, in, one part of the company and transfer that money into what we would all love to do is spur up a solar hot water industry. The worst thing in Europe I noticed about the solar hot water industries is, especially in France and in Italy where things are sadly incompetent these days, you, you, um, you, you might buy something and then you know, six months later you need to repair it and the company's out of business. Volume is gonna be everything. And um, I think Tesla's still on the whole a bit, but you know, that's the that's the risk takers. That's how, no, I mean, I'm, that's the only way I can see how to do it. And and um, and you build you build a market, and you build these regulations. I was talking to some of the lead guys recently. I'm saying you guys are already outdated. The codes outdate you. And um, what are you going to do next? And they said, I don't know. And I said, Look, what you got to go? No more no more lead platinum. You got to go lead. Um, Sonic or something. You've got you, you, you quantum. We call it quantum lead. You you've got to make. This is my yeah. this is my thesis. In New Mexico. You've got to make more energy than you consume. Not just save it. Not just be off grid. You got to actually the rain coming off the roofs has to create more energy than the place itself consumes. When you get that in your mind and you make that your, they say your target for. Um, at least as an architect for consumption, and that's the same as being done in cars. And so now you're talking. And to be honest, um, you know, you guys know Stuart Brand's book, the the Whole Earth Catalog from years ago. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was Stuart lives in a tugboat out in Marin County, out of the down on the the waterfront, and uh, we were eating dinner about five years ago. I was working on a book, and um, I've written a couple of books. Um, about my deeper passion, which is not the energy world, I'll tell you, it's a whole other world about culture. But um, he he thinks it's that's it. It's high vol, it's high density, and nuclear is the only way we're ever going to get out of this. Our consumption of electricity, you know, liquid power is so great. I mean, if if you really look at it, while while America is probably one of the most energy efficient countries in the world next to Europe compared to South America or Asia. Um, our consumption just keeps going up and up and up and, and we get more and more efficient. But like I said about the, my clients, I don't see how you can tell them all you need is two LED lights and the PV does everything. If you put 20 in, it only does 20% of everything. <laughs> and it's the same old story. There's no pill for, for you know, you got to get out and jog and eat less to lose weight you can't just take a pill and um i don't know maybe i'm depressing you but that's that's that but i do see i do see uh people doing this you know so i'm i'm happy about that i'm just gonna jump in too so i think we have a mix of people here where we have the you know people who think they're the next elon musk but we also have a lot of new people that <laughs> like are coming new in the industry and they're they're kind of in your like you know trying to find those those people to take it to the next level i guess so maybe just talk about especially when you're in new york you know we're in brooklyn right now like how did you know how to build a community here and like what advice would you have you know in the, the age of the the iphone i guess how it's different and, and uh any advice for for us building a community here oh gosh 
That's a good question. Um, court power and um, get your hands dirty. I mean, just get out in the street and just make an example. I mean, you know, I think, and then get the powerful to pay attention and, and to get them to benefit from it. And like I did, I got Dick Ottinger more votes. This is all intuitive. I, I don't know where I get these intuitions, but, and, and it was also to get the project done. And it was also to get local people engaged because their faces, their stuff matters. And I'm, I'm just a big believer in one single typology project can start a prairie fire, you know? Um, I think that was Mao's great phrase, a, a spark can start a prairie fire. So you, you, um, I think to me, tag your minds into policy and ideas and big thinking, but, but act small, get something done, get, get recognition on it, get, get people to touch it and smell it and feel it, do an example and, and, um, and walk the talk and then, and then have a whole plan behind you about how you're going to finance, who's going to be your investor and then get out there and push the political objectives that, that help stimulate or regulate that. But most importantly, get, get people jobs, you know, give them, make it a money maker, um, not a money taker. That's really powerful. I mean, the Dems just lost an entire election over that. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a big, big issue. Imagine if all those solar collectors, production facilities had gone to West Virginia coal country instead of China. A whole different game would have happened. A whole different game. Is that a bad answer? <laughs> I, no, it's good. It's helpful. Anyone, anyone else? Maybe one more question. Yeah. yeah, any final? Kyle's got one. Hop on in here. There's a whole, uh, you know, bunch of people over here too, by the way, that are, that are off screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Um, my question kind of relates on your personal background and how you've acquired the skills. Um, obviously your background's in architecture and you've had a very eclectic career doing lots of different things. You've had to learn some engineering. Um, you've had to work with people and policy. Um, I was just kind of curious about your process for learning new skills, things that um, you haven't necessarily seen before and how you've acquired those um, abilities over the course of your career. Hmm. Um, in, in the Greek world, techne is technology, right? And architecte is um, the master technology. Master, and tecton is a brick. So architecture, our job is more like a liberal artist. We have to not say what you do is, is, is not how you do it, but what you do, how to think, not what to think, right? So that's why I dropped out of all this to go study the great books. It sounds really often, but it's the only, edu it's real education. You've got, what I'm driving at is you've got to, um, it's all about people. That the technology, the tech, the tech stuff is readily available. We can all learn, and we have to know it, and we have to be really good at it. But the sales pitch, the the connect, the connection to culture, to people, that's what changes everything. I mean, I I, I wrote a, my book, the Archaeology of Tomorrow, my first book, and about my work and stuff. And one of the key issues in there is about this. By, by the time I was 30, I was really up on the green, but I missed the purple. And what I meant by that was I missed people and losing cultures of the world, losing two languages a month globally means two entire ways of the human imagination, which is really what distinguishes us from animals and nature. We think <coughs> very simple and, and we emote. And when you, when you, if you develop the skills to talk to people and bring them in, you win the victory. Nature itself will never, nature, remember that as um, Luke Hahn once did, one of the Arctics once said, the sunset is not aware of itself. Nature doesn't give a damn about us. <laughs> you know, this, this notion of saving people and people saving people is really the language that people speak. 
they don't speak about BTUs on the head of a pen or KWH. They live by it. They understand it, but they don't. I mean, it's so boring. And, and <laughs> you know, and, but, you know, the story, storytelling and the human story is, is to me the great, great asset that actually changes things. It changes politics. It changes entrepreneurship. It changes, uh, it's a flag that it's, it's, it's the human soul. You have to, you have to speak to it and then you have all you need. Um, because the technology, honestly, there's very little new. Think about it. Um, there are only four uses of a square foot of, of sunlight and each has a return of investment. And I, I came up with this when we were saving the snail darter at TVA with the dams. I don't know if you remember these long ago issues, but People didn't want to put a dam up because they wanted to save this species, the snail darter. So we did a huge study on what's the value of a square foot of sunlight. Well, there's photo um, synthetic plants. That's probably more important than electricity. <laughs> but there's photothermal, which is solar heat and hot water and so on. Um, then there's this new really cool thing called photovoltaic. You can make electricity. Electricity is magic. I mean, all the stuff we're doing now is electric. And all of those have a pretty decent ROI. But what amused me in the report I gave with Dave on the, with all the community was the highest return on investment is what I call photothermal epidermal. <laughs> Put me on a green roof in sunbathing and I will pay you a lot more money per hour than anything I'll pay for the rest of the photo. <laughs> So it's a joke, but it's true. It's true that, like for instance, well, I mean, a green roof is, is, is BS in my business. I mean, it has no insulation value. A foot of dirt is R3 or 4 if you're lucky. An inch of insulation now can be R7, you know? And the roof leaks, and there's some green plants up there. And if you, if you think it's gonna create oxygen for an urban environment like the Bronx or Brooklyn or what, you're crazy. It's meaningless. But why do we like it? It's because we miss nature. We go up on the roof to not get suntan, but to smell the flowers, to be a gar in a garden. I mean, that's why it's so seductive. And yet, technologically, when you actually put it down on the measuring thing and the water retention, all this, it's totally BS. And it's extremely expensive. For a foot. So you got you to think technically, but you got to also think about why, nothing wrong with doing it. I just saw, I was in Milan two weeks ago. I mean, there's a whole like two 20 story buildings that are 100% covered in trees. I don't know if you've seen this project. It's outstanding. I mean, every balcony has got like five trees on it. I just worry about when all, all that species gets an infection and the whole building <laughs> becomes the, the world's largest dead geopet, you know? But, <laughs> but, but, the, but the point is, we, we love nature because it makes us feel good, but don't, don't confuse that with um, the power of stainless steel and styrofoam for saving the planet. They're two different things completely, but they sell because the human is being spoken to, nature is speaking to them, and that's what we miss. We're fossil fuel spoiled brats. One of the big allures of the environmental movement is that people miss nature. They miss cold weather, they miss, um, being out in it they don't camp anymore they i mean everybody you know sits at the coffee shop and you know communicates to themselves and um so it i think we're in and that's nothing to say about the culture of of, of of communication it's just to say that um that's really one of the big powers is the emotional drive to get back to smelling the smelling the air you know I think that's a really good wrap. Yeah. yeah, that, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, I could go on forever, but uh, you know, I'm in DC on Friday, so I'll, I'll swing. Oh, by. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely here. I have to, and yeah. uh, if any of you guys are ever in DC, you're welcome to stop in. I mean, my office, I'll tell you, you got to look at my second book called the mythic modern um, architecture and the spirit of place and expeditions. I've taken students for, 24 years since I got here. 
I, I picked 20 students out of the university architecture department. I'm an adjunct professor on it. And uh, we find an ancient, ancient, ancient culture somewhere in the world. I find it like the mythology of the Kalevala of Finland or Peru Machu Picchu and the, the star, the star dark spaces. These are really eccentric Joseph Campbell Jungian mythological stories, which are the stories of, of, of every culture. And we design a project like a, as you would a synagogue or a church or a mosque that actually evokes that culture's view of itself. And the shape of that actually will evoke that power in you. It, it, it's people cry when they come into these projects. We design them in one semester. I go there, raise some money with local people. We find land outside the building department's uh, purview. And um, we build the whole project in nine days. And the last eight have won national design awards, national AI design awards for the students. Um, and it's really about, my whole view is that eco the, the cultural literacy and ecological literacy in modern architecture with modern technology, um, that's really the future. And when you blend the two together, culture will lead the flag to save nature. Nature will never save people. In fact, Nature's quite a bitch and there never was a noble savage. You're gonna to have to get that in your heads. Um, that, that, that you have, we, could, we create culture and the culture you're creating will save the planet, not the reverse. And studying that has been my other big passion and I, I've written about it and we, once again, walk the talk every year. It's amazing. When you see, when you go to the other website, Spirit of Place, it's in my email it'll shock you. There's a documentary about what we've done. And you know what? All those students have come back now with seeing more than they've, knowing more than they've seen and seeing more than they know. <laughs> and, and what that did is change their whole view about why nature matters. It's because cultures in different parts of the world are so integrated with that nature. And that keeps them alive at night, not BTUs. <laughs> Amen. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, hope I see you guys here. And um, if I get up to New York, I'll definitely pop by for sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know when you're in New York. Uh, yeah. Definitely. First Wednesday of the month. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, to see. I'd like to hear what y'all are doing. I'd like to really sniff it out. It'd be great, especially if we can integrate you in our work too. A lot of cool projects going on in here. So we'll 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 be in touch. Well, you know what they say in Texas. Adios. <laughs> Good night, Thank, you. Ended. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Good night, y'all. Thank you. Good night.